All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. This is the last of this series of five talks to form a commentary on our book, Self-Unfoldment. I'm looking through the closing chapters. Several things came to mind, which I think should be added to the text as it appears, and perhaps someday we will be able to include it in future editions. But now, this is a preview. We have discussed at considerable length the problem of realization, and I hope that from both the discussion and the book, you have a fair idea of what we mean by this term. But I think we can carry it a little further, to represent a clear state of internal honesty. Actually, all spiritual growth must begin with honesty. And while the average person certainly is not out to filch his neighbor's goods, there are forms of honesty which we do not understand. And one of the most complicated is internal honesty. There are so many situations which tempt us away from simple, direct, honest evaluation. And I know of no work dealing with this subject more appropriate than one of the discourses of Buddha. The original discourse is rather complicated and involves a number of strange and difficult terms, and also embraces a much larger area than we can deal with at the moment. So I want to uh, paraphrase or simplify a few of the basic thoughts in order that perhaps they will help us to understand the subject, the subject of internal honesty. Uh, the this course is arranged in a curious series of repetitive phrases which arise in a good many of Buddhist teachings. And these, uh, while they may seem unnecessary, have a tendency to fix the thoughts more clearly in our mind. So we can take one or two of the points and dress them a little in modern terms, but try to keep something of this reiterative phrasing, which I think has help, has helpfulness in it. He says in substance, for example, uh, when desire arises in the mind, a man may say, this I desire, this is desirable. If I have this, I shall be happy. If I do not have this, I shall be unhappy. Therefore, I must quest desperately after the object of my desire. Then Buddha says, but the wise man, when desire arises in the mind, shall say, desire has arisen in the mind. This is all the fact we have to deal with. This is the substance all the rest is lies. Now, if we can come down to this very simple core realization, we will begin to have a greater insight into realization as honesty. Buddha then goes on to take a, a wide variety of situations. He says, a man may say to himself, this I hate. Therefore, this is hateful. Uh, this I must oppose. I must dislike. I must indicate in every way possible that I abhor this thing. I must turn against it, all the antagonism I possess. But the wise man 
when hate arises in the mind, she'll say, hate has arisen in my mind. That is the entire substance of this thing. Now, if we can get this close to fact, it will be a very helpful and wonderful thing. Some people are a little afraid of facts. They regard it as cold, rather calculating, not very inspiring. But this concept as given by Buddha is not cold, nor is it condemning, nor is it self-criticizing, nor does it lack gentleness or insight. It is simply the gentle fact. If we can apply this type of gentle fact to the various situations that come along in which we have to face, we shall discover the basic point that he is trying to clear for us. Namely, that we, we live in two conditions. One is the basic condition of desiring. Desire arises within us spontaneously. And the second condition is the perpetual quest of that which is desired. Consequently, what we call activity is almost exclusively the fulfillment of desire in some way. It may take complicated, highly intellectualized forms. But we are pressed by certain attitudes which arise in us. And in due course, we become enslaved by these attitudes. We become their servants. We find our entire life spent in trying to satisfy this stream of desire that is constantly flowing from its fountains within ourselves. We therefore seldom pause to say to ourselves, do I need this which I desire? Is my desire right? Is it necessary? Is it good? Is it valid? Rather than this, we simply go on desiring and gradually lose the habit of examining the desire in terms of fact. Now, if we were able to control this desire pattern well enough, we would probably ultimately reach that condition in which we could censor desire before it moves into action. If we could do this, we would live more modestly and would find that our means and our conditions would become closer to our needs than we had previously imagined. So the only place where we can really cut off illusion is at its root. And that root is always in ourselves. Realization helps us to understand the nature of this root and gives us the strength and discrimination to analyze ourselves honestly. Now, honesty goes beyond even these physical desires. It goes into thought, into beliefs, into convictions, into policies by which we live, into reactions to conditions that arise around us. But always, we must ask ourselves the simple question, what is the fact? And the fact separated from all its involvement is not only simpler uh, than it might first appear, but at this stage in its development, the desire can be changed and corrected rather easily. There is an old story of the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, one of the world's most magnificent scenic panoramas, was originally a tiny little trench in the ground, probably an inch deep. At that time, any man could have changed its course with his foot. Now, there is no force known to man 
that can change its course. Or if such a thing be achieved by engineering, it would represent a vast expenditure of time and energy. It is the same with our own patterns, with the flow of our own impulses. If we can catch these at their roots, if we can work at them from their beginnings, we will simplify and order life tremendously. Realization exists to help us uh, to understand all these things. First of all, it gives us composure. And composure is necessary to honesty. We may mean to be honest, but if we are disturbed and unsettled within ourselves, uncomfortable, then we have not the same ability to estimate. In the presence of discomfort, our first impulse is to escape into a more comfortable condition. And in obedience to this impulse, we may go further away from fact. Thus, evasion, fulfillment, excuse, resentment, uh, these arise within us, but they tell us nothing that is truly useful, except that they themselves are false. Now, we cannot expect persons to make complete renovations of themselves in a moment, Certainly, Buddha never expected his disciples to achieve this. All that he asks is that the individual becomes aware. And having once established an awareness in himself, he finds it instinctive to begin to use this awareness in an effort to improve his condition. He becomes a little more thoughtful. He begins to practice a preventive therapy rather than to depend upon some curative agency for a remedy. Realization, as we have said, therefore, must be in an internal quietude. The individual must be able to relax. In order to relax, he must have values, because no individual can trust himself comfortably to the unknown. We have to chart the unknown. And most of all, we have to take out of it its formidable or dreadful appearance. The unknown is dangerous to us, only while we approach it without adequate internal enlightenment. So enlightenment is a measure, at least, man's turning the light of consciousness upon the unknown, and discovering probably to his amazement that the unknown is very pleasant that the unknown is really the source of all known good, as well as apparently the source of all known difficulty. The unknown is simply the unexperienced, that which we have not yet faced or solved. When it presents no problems different, no difficulties more real than those which also surround us in the known. And also in the unknown lie all our hopes the hopes of things yet to be done, dreams yet to be fulfilled, the best yet to be accomplished. So out of gradually increasing internal insight, we are able to attain composure. Composure is a kind of treaty that is set up between ourselves and other things. It is a truce. It is an end of hostility. It means that we have accepted a non-belligerent life, a life in which we are neither going to hurt nor be hurt. Rather, we are going to use facts to protect value, and in so doing, to live as nobly and serenely and beautifully as we can. Once some of these convictions begin to take hold, we begin to find internal resources that we did not suspect. We discover that within ourselves lie also all the elements needed for adjustment. It is not that inside we are all problems. Inside we are both problem and solution. If we overwork problem, we will be problem. 
If we work more industriously, industriously at solution, we will find solutions. The very same inner life is both our problem and our achievement. So that we do not need to take the attitude that we are weakness, or that we are insufficiency or instability. Another thing that we learn from realization is that at any given moment, each individual is sufficient to his own needs. This seems a very difficult thing to believe sometimes, for it, it is at some given moment that we suddenly feel that we are not sufficient to our own needs. The reason we are not sufficient is that we have not called upon sufficiency. We have rather acknowledged insufficiency. We have accepted the negative as inevitable. We have accepted the worst part of ourselves as the strongest part. Therefore, we have veritable interior consolation. We are sufficient to our need at any moment. The reason for this is that our needs arise from ourselves. Each individual, according to his own station in life consciousness, creates a situation around him, which is the direct result of what he is. It is not the result of what he might be or what he has been. It is the result of what he is. Therefore, the situation is always balanced by the person in that situation. The situation is never larger nor smaller than the person. It consequently follows that as the individual could get himself into a situation by a certain group of attitudes, he possesses also the means of extricating himself from that situation by the proper use of those same attitudes. He does not have to be bigger than he is to be what he is. He merely has to use the faculties and powers with which he is endowed. Now, it is quite obvious that the problems of a highly advanced physicist might be quite different from the problems of an average uh, clerk in a store. Also, the attainments of these two persons may be different. But the physicist, in ratio to his problem, is in exactly the same situation as the clerk in ratio to his problem. The physicist can just solve his problem if he will. The clerk can just solve his problem if he will. Each has been given a kind of allotment, and this allotment is the cause of his difficulty and the solution. He must therefore never feel that he must become more than he can be in order to achieve freedom from conditions as they are. He merely has to use properly the instruments already at his command. It is not lack of instruments, it is lack of use that perpetuates a misfortune. Realization, then, is attainable on almost any conceivable level. We are not even sure that realization is limited to human beings. There are symptoms and indications which might cause us to think that certain members of the animal kingdom also have rudimentary realization. They have certain internal acceptances, which that perhaps with them are more instinctive than with us. But these acceptances seem to indicate that these creatures are very close to a source of life or a source of knowledge that is equal to their need and have been wonderfully endowed with the faculty required for the preservation of themselves through normal situations, perhaps not through ex ex excessive situations, but certainly uh, they have faculties which can guide them, and our own human needs are supplied by faculties which can guide us with equal effectiveness. Realization 
is a way of making these values available to the conscious person. It is one thing to have your treasures locked in a house, and it is another thing to bring these treasures into light and to use them and to apply them to their proper ends. In the uh, Bible story, uh, Jesus was not too patient with the man who buried his talent. Rather, it was important that this individual should make use of his abilities, make use of his resources, and not lock them within himself. The realization also prevents us from doing one of the the things that can make troubles worse very quickly, and that is a desperate thrashing out against adversity. The individual who under pressure becomes desperate is only increasing his own dilemma. Realization prevents this deep end situation. It causes the person to recognize that the greater his responsibility or the more real his problem, the greater his need for quietude. That it is only in the quietude of personal integration that we can work our way through problems using all of the resources at our, uh, uh, at our hand or uh, available to us. The moment we lose this internal calm, we block out full areas of mental and emotional wisdom. We close ourselves to these principles which alone could bring us relief. So in the quietude of things, in realization, we evaluate our own living. We think it through. We live with ourselves conscious. We try to be as impersonal in the judging of ourselves as we can. We think no longer of our poor, battered selfness. We think, rather, of our own incorrigibilities, uh, those natural delinquencies which produce natural sorrow. And we know that the only answer is to correct and to curb, uh, to integrate and to strengthen. Now, realization as itself has been taught, or as a fact in itself, has been taught in many systems. But I have always personally felt that when you isolate a discipline from the common uh, intercourse of life, you very largely destroy its effectiveness. We know that uh, mystics have retired to forlorn and desolate places and there have tried to live in communion with themselves. We know also that throughout nearly all of the records that we have of human endeavor, certain spiritual virtues have been given tremendous prominence and nearly all other as aspects of life have been neglected. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why uh, the virtues haven't worked better. It is quite possible that we would be much further along in our religious life if we had not isolated it, if we had not considered it to be either a particular phase of existence or, by contrary attitude, total existence with nothing else left of importance. We have gone overboard one way or another. And when the individual goes overboard, he's in the water. And when he is in the water, if he use the parlance of the day, he may very well become moist. In fact, he may drown. So, in our realization, we have to be rather careful that uh, we do not drive it, that we do not uh, go beyond the natural field for which it is intended. To do a good job on the level of realization discipline, we must be certain, therefore, that it is not realization under pressure. 
Or as one man came to me one day and he said, I have experienced what I call pressureful relaxation. Now this is what I think some of us have done in connection with religion. Um, we have overdone a certain virtues. We have forced things rather than to recognize that in realization anything which tips it away from its own natural equilibrium, destroys it as far as a useful instrument for our purpose. Realization, then, does not come alone from love of God or love of man. These help. These are great and powerful instruments of, re of uh, revelation and of insight. But there is more. Realization arises from a whole group of simple, natural processes, which must also be properly cultivated. The individual who loves God but does not appreciate beauty is deficient in a very marked manner. An individual who cannot enjoy simple things will probably not very soon have the opportunity to enjoy universal consciousness. We have to balance this realization problem. It must be a rich realization. And it must not, under any circumstance, arise from a pressure by which an individual might be caused to say to himself, I cannot endure things as they are. Therefore, I've got to outgrow them or perish. Uh, this might be the substance of a dilemma but still it is not the right attitude. Realization is the condition in which we want to realize more because what we already realize is so sufficient. Not that we are impoverished and bankrupt at the moment and are searching desperately to find some way of getting a small deposit in our own name. Realization is not running away from the miserable. Because if the miserable still remains, we are not ready for realization. It does not mean a hastening from loneliness or um, isolation of any kind. It does not mean that we are seeking a cure or a remedy or an answer, primarily. Realization is much more than these things, and very different. Realization is more actually the wonderful experience of the thing as it is, needing no more than itself, but only available to us when we have begun to warm up appreciation in many areas of our existence. This is why, for so long, I have advocated that the individual who searches for spiritual values uh, shall have as large an area of conscious experience as possible. The more he can experience without criticism or condemnation, the better he is. This I do not mean to imply that he should not be, uh, uh, should not be aware of the faults of his work, but that beyond this awareness of faults, should also be a, an awareness of reason and meaning. The things are as they are because certain uh, processes are in their midmost methods. They are not complete. They are not perfect. Yet in themselves, they are meaningful and worthy of our most thoughtful and generous consideration. I like to think, therefore, that any person who is interested in self-improvement can sit down and enjoy a good book. Not necessarily a philosophical book, but a book which is rich in human experience. A book which has gently and lovingly uh, carried a message from some person who really believed that he had a contribution to make. Good literature is important to good living. Good art is important. The individual who says to himself, yes, uh, that's true, uh, 
I need these things, but I'm too busy. I'll get around to it someday. Has not in himself the hunger for the beautiful. And the lack of this natural appetite is going to affect his spiritual life just as much as it affects his environment. The individual who is not anxious to be busy, who does not feel that work is life, also is closing himself uh, to growth and progress. The individual who overvalues leisure, seeking to escape useful and interesting tasks simply because of the belief that leisure is the sign of superiority. This type of person is in trouble. One of the greatest difficulties in our modern fields of psychology arises from the fact that the individual has mistaken leisure for personal attainment, and he has done nothing with it. Leisure without proper vision, without proper insight, can be a very heavy burden upon the flesh and lead us into many troubles. The individual, therefore, who has no interest in nature, in flowers and plants and birds and beasts, who has no sympathy for the art and the craft and the trades, who has no instinct to make something with his own hands, to create. Such a person is impoverished in those attitudes which are essential to realization. Realization is from a richness and not from a poverty. And our inner meditations are richest and most beautiful when they are supported by many glorious experiences which we have been permitted to enjoy in the course of years. Thus our realization is a mature, a, a rich fulfillment of things. Let us say to ourselves, just because uh, it will uh, give us a point to work with, supposing an accident occurred to us. Supposing tomorrow we found ourselves in a terrible accident from which we were able to survive, but with the loss of sight and the loss of motion, that we had nothing left but our internal life and hearing. Would such a condition leave us totally impoverished? It did not leave Helen Keller totally impoverished although she had most of them, but she did have the loss of more than one faculty. She neither saw nor heard. Yet her life became extremely rich because of its inwardness. Now the person in the midstream of life, suddenly deprived of his external resources, would have to build his life out of his own experience. Let us also remember that someday we shall be deprived not only of sight, hearing, touch, smell, and taste, but also of body, by a mysterious circumstance which we call death. As far as this world is concerned, we will uh, rest with the ages. What do we take with us? Those things which we take with us must be the richness of our inner life, and as Buddha says, our experience, and as Socrates said, that which we have learned. These are the things which we take with us. Now when we enter into meditation or realization, we do almost the same thing. We cut out the world temporarily, maybe for five minutes only. But in those five minutes, we live more intimately with ourselves than at any other time in our existence. It is therefore important to us that this inner self be rich. Rich not with false notions or opinions or merely intellection, which falls away very quickly, but rich in achieved value, rich in memories, beautiful, true, wise 
rich in the knowledge of friendships, rich in achievement, rich in appreciation, rich in the sense of creative self-expression. These things become the basis of a different kind of warmth. This is no longer the warmth of desiring. It is rather the gentle warmth of reflection. It surrounds us with a very warm glow, a very friendliness, a freedom from loneliness or isolation because of the richness in ourselves. This warmth is not danger. It is not the fire of hate or jealousy. It is the warmth of understanding, a very different kind of temperature. The realization, meaning that we go in, means that we must find on the inside what we need. And we can only find there what we have put there. And as Socrates pointed out, life is a kind of preparation for something beyond life. So also experience. Uh, all of the constructive values which we have generated in our nature are preparations for the release of the full internal. Also remember that release is itself a valid factor in realization coming under the general heading of the creation of the transcendent being. Release means the ability to express for that which is within to come out, to find adequate and proper channels. Release, therefore, is only adequate when the personality and the body are suitable for this release. The old story about the new wine and the old bottles and vice versa comes to mind. It is also true that the training of the body, the unfoldment of its aptitude, this can be tremendously significant. Suppose we say for a moment that you are a musician. Actually, your music has always been a close interest. And from this music, you have gradually moved into a mystical appreciation of life. How fortunate, then, you are. For now you have hands that are trained, so that they will respond instinctively to the impulses of your thought. You can sit down at a musical instrument, and you can play these melodies which you hear within yourself, which are not of this world. How much more these melodies would be lost if your own skill was not equal to your internal appreciation. Unless you can release, you have to a measure failed in your purpose. Or if you are a vocalist, your trained body reacting uh, to the impulses of your will will permit you to express creatively through song uh, the inner convictions of your country. A good carpenter has skilled hands. A great surgeon has skilled hands. Persons in every walk of life who achieve gain certain skills. And skill is mental, emotional, or bodily control. Thus, the controlled body becomes the adequate instrument for the expression of disciplined conviction. One without the other is imperfect. And while it is undoubtedly true that the internal takes precedence over the external, for without the internal, there is no justification for the external. It is also even more true 
that the internal must use the external as the channel or means of its expression and release. And that the body, the mind, and the emotions are not responsive. If the individual has no trained ability with which to express that which is within himself, he is to a measure deprived of his greatest usefulness. Now, it's a possibility that these trained abilities are the more unselfish part. For it is perfectly possible for the individual to feel that he has inner knowledge. But the unselfish part is to share, to see that this knowledge serves common need. And unless this instinct is also present, there is something wrong with knowledge. And if the individual having internal enlightenment has no desire and no instinct to express this in some way, he is also deficient in uh, many of the more natural human graces. It is not his expression of his enlightenment that will cause trouble. It is, however, the expression of his unenlightenment, perhaps not even so recognized, that may cause trouble a certain amount of difficulty. So in realization, we need the cooperation of the total personality. We need the whole of the person brought together uh, to become the instrument of one purpose. And the richer this personality is, the more ways it can use or distribute or rationalize knowledge. And the skillful person, dominated by a great conviction, is the most useful of all individuals. Skill without conviction is dangerous. But conviction without skill is frustration. Now many people feel that if the internal adjustments are made, the skill will inevitably follow. This is not quite true. I've known a great many persons interested in various types of development, but I have never learned that any one of them mastered a foreign language without studying it, or mastered music without taking lessons or disciplining themselves. Some have been self-instructed, but this self-instruction still requires the same skill and patience and probably a great deal more willpower than the instruction by normal methods. So it is important to know that uh, our conscious growth depends upon two more or less interlocked factors. One, our great desire to grow and to know, and the other, our willingness to work for what we desire. We get plenty of real effort, real libido behind this wish that we might be better. In other words, never for a moment permit the wish to be considered the act. The wish may start us, may give us some reason or purpose for doing something, but while it remains only in a wishful state, it is without vitality, it is impotent and useless. It must be transformed by discipline and dedication uh, to, a, to an achieved state of usefulness. Realization has certain other values, but we can't pause with them too long because one of the principal parts of the lesson for this evening deals with the factor of illumination. Now, illumination is to the disciplined life of man that which is equivalent to the fruitfulness of the tree or the plant. In other words, all things have their growth and their budding and their flowering. Uh, but the true achievement is always truthfulness. It is the fulfillment of the purpose for which the being exists. Our Eastern philosophers have always taught that what we broadly and rather weakly refer to illumination is 
the natural destiny of all creatures possesses. In other words, it is the final victory of consciousness over the dream, as we might suspect, however, from the very nature of the parallels used to express it, is not a victory times when these experiences seem to gather into larger patterns. But every time we open our eyes in the morning, it is a mystical experience about the day. And every time we close them at night, it is a mystical experience about the night. Every thing, every faculty that responds and awakens, every experience that comes to us is a continuous invitation to grow. And it is the acceptance, the simple, direct, factual, honest acceptance of these opportunities that gradually leads to the larger achievement. But just as the small child must first be taught its letters and then perhaps pass on to words, so each individual must be taught the small mysteries before he can comprehend the greater ones. At the moment in education, we are at a bit of an impasse. We are suddenly putting young people into college who cannot read the letters of the alphabet. This we begin to doubt as to whether it is progressive education or not. We begin to realize that nobody wants to learn the first steps anymore. We all want to start at the top and work down, and that's what most people do. We do not wish, uh, when we study music, to play those abominable scales for five years. If we cannot play a complete composition in two weeks, we do not intend to be musicians. If we do play a complete composition in two weeks, it is doubtful if we will ever be musicians, because such a bad start is almost certain to condition the future. We lack patience, and we do the same thing in our religion. I know persons who have come very frankly and told me that they would very well like to attend our activities. In fact, if we had a membership, they'd join, only on one condition, however, that they would be enlightened within two weeks. Well, they believed it. They had received very bad training, and I'm happy to say we didn't contribute any further errors to it. But... The fact remains that we all have certain ambitions, and our spiritual ambitions are often dangerous, because they again destroy that peace within us, that realization, that quietness, which permits us to accept without question or doubt that all things come in their proper season and according to their proper time. So in the uh, search for the enlargement of consciousness, we do seek illumination as a series of familiar experiences. Now there are occasions, undoubtedly recorded, in which mystics have apparently broken through these veils very suddenly. There are cases apparently where in a single instant a life is transformed from a purely objective situation to a highly subjective. But as we go through the lives of these mystics, we realize that this happened because whether they knew it or not, they were under discipline, usually under the discipline of themselves. Uh, there is no doubt uh, that the lines in Faust are correct that luck is closely linked to merit, doth never to the fool occur, and he the wise man stone. I swear it, the stone had no philosopher. And uh, an example, perhaps two examples, come to mind at this point. One is Baron Emanuel Swedenborg. Swedenborg was suddenly, apparently, illumined. That he had some kind of very powerful interior experiences we know. And we say to ourselves, well, he wasn't 
particularly dedicated to these things, more or less apparently an accident. Why can't the same accident happen to us? Well, as perhaps if you have studied Swedenborg's life more attentively, you are willing to uh, live as he lived. Perhaps the ex accident might happen to you. But it would help a great deal if you had 40 years of higher mathematics, as he had. It would make all the difference in the world, because he had a magnificently trained mind. Now, the second thing that we might mention, the second person, is Jeremy, the German mystic and shoemaker. He was a man who apparently received one of the most extraordinary revelations of all time. Yet, was not a man who was cultured, who was educated, or had achieved in these things which we commonly associate with life. And it is a little difficult to assume that merely pegging shoes was the full explanation. It wasn't. Again, if you want to live as he lived, it might then not be quite so mysterious if something of an extraordinary nature occurred to you. This man was born with one of the most extraordinary natures that I suppose were to, were to be, was to be found in the world. From infancy, he was never known to have uttered an unkind word. He was never known to be angry at anyone. And from no particular purpose, as we can see it, but perhaps from the utter devotion and devoutness of his own heart, he lived throughout his life, both before and after this experience, in a state of the most profound, unselfish love for his fellow men. And his enemy during most of his entire life, self-appointed enemy, was a local theologian. And when Bamey went to church every Sunday, as he went to church, and sat quietly in his pew, he listened month after month and year after year, patiently, quietly, and with gentle dignity, while this minister heaped abuse upon him in every sermon. Yet never did he defend himself, never did he contradict, never did he say an unkind word to or about that clergyman. And on one occasion, when he went to beg this man to be less unkind, and to try to understand that he, Bailey, was really a very devout and pious man, the clergyman threw his boots at him. Bailey quietly picked up the boots and put them back beside the clergyman's chair, said thank you, and walked out. If you want to live like that, it's quite possible a miraculous experience might also occur to you. So we cannot say, certainly, or evidently, that this mystical experience comes to those who do not deserve it. If it does, then there is no law in the universe. It has to be either consciously or unconsciously merited. But whereas some apparently have to discipline themselves to receive it in one way or another, others appear to be so naturally endowed with the gentlest of values, with the most unselfish and devout of attitudes, that this experience is perfectly normal and natural to them. But in each case, you will find that the life, to a measure it, and a large measure, to our own understanding, has produced a natural shooting. It has come to that end which was suitable and proper to itself never to something that is a contradiction. Illumination has been estimated in many ways. One question is, what are we to understand by the term cosmic consciousness? Is illumination to be regarded as an ultimate? Is there a condition in which we seem to stand as Dante stood in the presence of the celestial choirs and see the whole heavens unfold in their majesty. Is illumination to be understood thus as total conscious awareness, or in Buddha, Buddhism, total absorption into being, 
return to utter and infinite essence? Is it the final and unconditioned termination of all imperfect existence? This we do not know, because we are never able to determine the essential fact of consciousness apart from the instruments through which it operates. Therefore, we cannot be certain uh, that by the term illumination we actually mean ultimate or infinite. What in more probability we are meaning is the enlightenment of the state of consciousness as it exists in us and in the compound constitution which we inhabit. Therefore, illumination is in all probabilities victory over the present cycle of existence, victory over the uncertainties of a conditioned being. This victory over condition does not necessarily mean that there cannot be other conditions, nor does it mean that there cannot be other mysteries uh, around which our illumination does not center because these other mysteries are totally unknown to us. Therefore, about them we can have no enlightened comprehension. But in any event, we may say that the mystical experience represents the most powerful factor in the justification of the individual spiritual conviction. It is a transmutation of hopes and desires and yearnings and aspirations, their transmutation into established inner fact, from which there can no longer be any essential departure. Plotinus describes the illumination that came to him. He declared that on two or three occasions only during his life, he was privileged for a very brief instant to be lifted up into identity with reality. His nature was not such, his constitution was not such, that he could endure this prolonged, this state in a prolonged way. In a few instants, in a minute or two, he had exhausted his own power to react. The body simply could not carry the tremendous intensity of this experience, and he dropped back again into his normal consciousness. But he declared that these two or three Brief experiences were such that from that time on his mind, his outer life, his emotions and his conduct could never uh, depart from the truth which he had come to inwardly know. That he was working no longer from hopes and fears, but from certainties. And that once certainty took hold of the inner life, all uncertainty ceased, and the meaning reality could no longer be doubted or denied. And complete allegiance to this reality became natural and inevitable. There could no longer rise even a note of dissension. There was no other purpose for life as meaningful or as valuable. So I like to think for students working along with this problem that illumination is a continual, gradual unfoldment of spiritual appreciation expressed continuously by better adjustments in action. For unless illumination leads to modification of conduct toward truth, it cannot be regarded as valid. Now there is one point that perhaps will be of some interest here. In psychology, there is a reference made to what are called archetypal dreams. And it has been assumed by many psychologists that archetypal dreams have a particular and special authority, that they very seldom occur without an important consequence closely related to them. I would say that the difference between a true mystical experience and one which may arise out of self-hallucination or a simply wishful thinking, the difference lies in this validity which accompanies the genuine experience. 
The individual who experiences a true internal mystical enlargement does not experience something that is simply wonderful, simply beautiful, simply terrific. He doesn't have this experience of being a participant um, obvious reason. It is not something that just happens. Illumination nearly always ties into a pattern of immediate need. Illumination seems to indicate that under the necessity of a situation, the trained, unfolded, dedicated, consecrated consciousness breaks through because it has been called upon. It has been called forth into action. Now, however, this does not necessarily mean that it responds to a cry of desperation from the ego. Illumination nearly always occurs in the presence of a need carried in suspension. And this, I, uh, I mean something like this, perhaps. Supposing in an emergency the individual says, I, I've just got to find a solution, I've just got to find a solution. Well, he'll say that from now on, because he has brought himself completely by his own attitude. But if this person is devout in his religious life and in the presence of a great emergency or a great challenge, he sits down and asks the guidance of heaven very quietly to himself in the presence of this emergency as the old American Indian medicine priest used to say, Father, show me the way. Show me the way. In other words, not to help me to do it my way, or I want it done this way, or this is the only solution I'll accept, but rather, not my will, but thine be done. A relaxation into the divine will, in which we stand ready to serve that revelation, whether it be according or not according to our own desire. In other words, we are not any longer seeking a solution conditioned to our own appetites. We are asking very simply for THE solution. And if this solution seems to work a hardship upon ourselves, we will still accept it and will fulfill it, because we are no longer concerned with hardship or lack of hardship. We are concerned with truth, with the fact with the reality as it is. Under those conditions, if we can allow this solution to be the working of the law in this matter and accept it without question, it is then quite possible that in our relaxation the light that we need will come. In fact, it nearly always comes. For there's nothing that can block it except our own lack of adequate adjustment with the principle involved. And the principle involved in all of these situations is not our will be done, but let the law be perfectly manifested in this work. If we then find that the law kicks us right out of the work, that is the perfect working of the law, and we accept. But usually, if we have this attitude and have gone this far, we shall find that the law is not far from the thing which we most devoutly believe to be necessary. So it is this problem of always uh, al aligning the, the illumination with the solution of a real or present need. This need is not an obsession, but it is a natural requirement. And that which is naturally required, nature will produce. Thus, nature provides us with what we have earned. But our, always our struggle is to try to get nature to give us something we haven't earned. And if we insist in this process long enough, nature will 
oblige us by giving us something that isn't so. Because nature will not permit that which is true uh, to be conveyed to that which is not able or willing to use truth as it was intended to be used. So illumination always takes form of this certain something that is added. It is this next and immediate need. And we can simply say, as the old country physician that I knew years ago, he was not one of the great school of medicine. He was just a good old country doctor. And he explained to me how he handled sickness. He said he knew about 50 different pills he could give people. He knew about four or five different major surgeries that he could perform on the kitchen table if necessary. He knew a dozen or twenty forms of minor surgery. He knew all kinds of uh, simple remedies such as putting your feet in hot water and your head in cold water, whatever the need was at the moment. But he said, when I get to the circumference of this, I'm through. The only thing I can do then is turn it back to God. So he said, when I cannot find a remedy in my book, he says, I just sit down and I say, God, if you want me to help this fellow to get well, you'll have to tell me how. And he said, usually I got the answer. And I got it sometimes in most remarkable ways. So there is this very simple approach to the same thing. And this old doctor getting a hunch, out of thin air when he needed it most, was quite convinced of the reality of divine intercession. And it worked. And because it worked, over a long lifetime, his faith was strong and clear. So the same thing can happen to each other. Illumination, therefore, is this something that comes when something is needed. And uh, the more unselfish and real the need, the more certain the light is to come. And by degrees, this process of the light coming through grows or enlarges as we improve and enlarge. It will finally, one of these greater experiences that we hear about and read about may come to us. Actually, the true mystic is not too much concerned. The person who is waiting from day to day for illumination is in a bad way. This is not the method by which it can be done. The method is very simple. Live the life and you will know the doctrine. Do the thing that needs doing every day and the light and light that you need hold in you and through you as it becomes necessary. That brings us to another paragraph here, which I wanted to mention also. Illumination can never come until the causes for it have been definitely established. Do not wait for it. Do not hope for it. Do not wonder about it. Do not fear that it will not come. Develop realization, normalize, and beautify life. And illumination will be the normal and natural consequence not of a single episode, not one tremendous burst of enlightenment, but a steady, released, and increasing flow of understanding into and through the lower faculties of the reason. Now this uh, brings us another point which I'd like to enlarge on, and that's this problem of the faculties of the reason. Because we've passed them off rather quickly here with little more than a few sentences. And I think there is more need for this matter. Uh, the processes of our faculties, as we have mentioned many times before, are two-way bridges by which impulse is carried in from the outer world and out from the inner life. These two processes are constantly functioning. Now, if the torrent or pressure of the inflow of external is greater than the corresponding pressure of the outpouring of internal, then the internal 
uh, elements are not released. The torrent is too strong, and the inner faculties are not able to come through because of this tremendous pressure of externals. Consequently, the inner faculties, which are not of themselves competitive, it's an interesting thing, I think, to realize that the consciousness of man is not dogmatic or dominating. In fact, it is so retiring by its very constitution that most people never locate it. It seldom has anything much to say. It never points out to anyone its own importance. It never reminds us that it is the master. It leaves us to discover these things for ourselves. Uh, many people have felt that deity was a little negligent because it allowed so many misfortunes to occur in this world. And we all feel at some time or other that we could certainly have done a better job of it. But actually, the entire mystery of truth is non-dogmatic. We use the word as though it had the whole weight of dogma behind it. But actually it is not. Truth comes as a small, still voice. Truth comes in extreme quietude. And illumination and all the things that have to do with this uh, unfoldment may be regarded as an exceedingly gentle, passing fact. The inner life never really tries to force its way out. It can only be released when the conscious purpose of the individual is uh, enlisted. The outside will flow in by accident, but the inside will only flow out by intent. It will never flow out by accident. The outside flows in with tremendous pressure upon us because the inner life of the individual is essentially negative. It is a sort of a vast area which accepts into itself almost any form of miscellaneous phenomena. On the other hand, if the internal life polarizes itself, then it becomes more positive than the phenomenal world. Yet this positiveness is not an aggressive, dominating, or dictatorial positiveness. It is simply an establishment of value that becomes too real for anything else to interfere with. So in our search for inner understanding, we have to find various ways of reducing the pressures that moving upon the surface of the personality obscure its depths. And we have to reduce the impact of phenomena because this impact causes us so much tension and attention that we are unable to make adequate use of our intuitive faculty. We are world bound. There are so many things happening around us that we are no longer able to be sensitive to the things that are happening within us. Thus we develop bad habits. Thus also we fall into various common errors of our day, simply because we do not have strength enough to remain aware of inward value under the pressure of outward circumstances. So again, we have this problem of the victory of internals over externals. The individual achieves this victory by realization and relaxation. Relaxation is not just letting the body sit somewhere. Relaxation is releasing the tension of faculties. Relaxation means that the objective sensory perception are no longer devoutly dedicated toward objects. The eye is not trying to see everything it can. The ear is not trying to hear everything it can. Or be by being bombarded by sounds it does not even want to hear. As Buddha points out, 
as we relax internally, we remove energy from the circumference faculties. In other words, there is no longer so much vital energy to stimulate sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell. These faculties are reduced in intensity because we have withdrawn energy from them. When they are so reduced in their own intensities, they do not bombard the central mental coordinator with all this wild confusion of symbolic phenomena. Because this bombardment slows down, order is reestablished within the self. Reflexes are brought to the condition that they can be handled. The individual is not seeing so much that he cannot consider any part of it. Reducing by degree this tremendous surging wave of phenomena beating against him, the individual thus begins to release internal life. He discovers that far more important than phenomena will be the testimony of the numinal part, the internal life. As the outer quiet, the inner can be known. The outer shouts, the inner seldom speaks above a whisper. Therefore, the sound and the fury destroy the power of the inner to be heard. Uh, there's an old Chinese fable that tells about a little bird, a very tiny little bird, with a very tiny but very beautiful little note that was sitting on the side of an old tree. And the sage came along, and there was a great storm. And the storm was so tremendous. The thunders rolled, and the winds blew. The trees were shaken. And the, and the roar of the storm was so much that you could not hear the, the note of the tiny little bird. So the old holy man sat down because he loved to hear birds sing. And he went into meditation. It was very quiet. One by one, he closed out the roaring of the storm, the, the sound of the winds, and all of these things and focused his consciousness entirely upon the song of the bird. And in a very few seconds, he could hear that little song perfectly. And there wasn't a sound from the song. He couldn't hear that at all, because he tuned it out. Now to a major, the storm is life, and the little bird is the human soul. And if we are able to shut out through our realization discipline, the false sound, we can hear the voice of the beautiful singer, like the singing Rohan, so greatly honored in China. So that uh, the voice of the infinite is always represented as a very gentle, quiet voice that can only be heard when all other sound is still. And realization, meditation, contemplation, concentration, these have as their ultimate end that we shall be able to achieve the divine silence within ourselves by which we shall be aware of the internal directive which come to us so faintly, so softly, that we can hardly note them. We have always thought of a God of fury, a God of battles, and a God thundering his commandments from the top of the flaming mountain, but we experience this power, not in this way at all. We experience it as a very gentle, subtle thing that can be heard only when that is the only thing we want to hear. When we are willing to listen to anything else, we will not hear the voice of truth. Now, here is another little point that I think is important. We discuss at some length here uh, the problem of Taoism. The second Taoist doctrine concerning illumination emphasizes the necessity for sufficiency. The doctrine creates itself, sustains itself, 
abides by itself, moves impelled by its own nature, and has no home but faith. Now this is a, a way in which the Taoist uses the symbol of the dragon to represent the nature of the completely sufficient doctrine. In other words, the uh, Taoist points out that the inner life of man achieves a kind of sufficiency, which as the illumination and as the enlightenment spreads, this sufficiency becomes so total that the person becomes a space dweller like the dragon. Now, this, the dragon never puts its foot upon the earth. The dragon must never be seen all of its body at one time, because if it is, it will destroy whoever sees it. Therefore, in art, the dragon is always partly enveloped in clouds, so that all of its body may not be seen at the same time. The dragon lives upon space. It lives in space. It nests in the sky without any... And the fact that it had to be partly concealed by clouds was that the human being cannot as yet the full doctrine. He can only perceive certain parts of it. Otherwise he is shattered beyond survival. But in this sense of sufficiency, I think we have a point that we'd like to uh, make. Well, this attacks the fundamental human impulse toward dependency. Even religion subtly inculcates a doctrine of dependency. Man is ever searching for a strength outside of himself upon which he can cast his burden. Thus, with our meditation and our discipline and our search for reality, there must come this sense of sufficiency without fear and also without arrogance. The individual must finally realize that his existence is complete in the term of self and faith. Any dependency must lead to compromise or to a false sense of dependence upon that which is apart from the truth. So man, leaning in one direction and leaning in another, is searching forever for something to sustain or support him. But he only needs the support because he himself is off balance. Thus equilibrium is self-sustaining. And this type of internal equilibrium is very important to man. As he proceeds in his studies and in his experiences, he must finally choose between a certain sense of weakness and a greater sense of strength. The person who is inwardly unfolding loses by degree the need for dependence loses the need for the dependence upon the opinions of others. He finally loses the sense of need for dependence upon belief or upon faith or upon any of these things. All of this dependence is necessary only while the dependent person is internally unillumined. But the full expression of enlightenment gives the insight that the person is forever sufficient to his need. The Taoists also use again in this particular symbolism the idea of the bird, because the bird has always been a thing of such beauty in the experience of man that it is easy for him to fall into mystical poetry or mystical thoughts about it. What could be more helpless from the standpoint of man's concept of things, than the little bird that builds its nest under the eave of our house. This bird and perhaps its mate are totally isolated. 
as far as associations are concerned. We have no evidence, whatever, uh, that they have any life apart from themselves. We cannot imagine that they have adequate insurance against difficulties, uh, that they have any one to cry to in the night when pain comes. They cannot send for a physician. They cannot engage a lawyer. They have no architect or builder to construct their house. They have no one to deliver food. They have no one to provide anything. And these two little furry uh, feathered creatures are alone in space. Alone in a little nest of broken twigs, perhaps a few feathers and bits of cloth and hair which they have gathered. This is their world. This is their home. They do not know when someone will come along and tear it down. They do not know whether the neighborhood cat will invade it. They are here completely alone, with nothing beyond themselves, not even parent, and later not even child. These little creatures are apparently completely free of any sense of loneliness. They do not know they are alone. The little bird does not know that he is alone. The wise man has forgotten that he is alone. This difference is very tremendous. The little bird also, when it builds its nest and bears its young, fulfills the mystery of life without knowing why. It continues its little way. And in nature, very few things die a natural death unless we consider that it is natural that they be prey for something else. But in that span of time, the song, the labor, the building, the nest, the eggs go on as long as life is given to them. There never seems to be any sign of serious neurosis. There are no frustrations and no inhibitions. There are no theologians to preach to them. Perhaps this is a blessed preservation. They have never been taught to be afraid because they live in a very w world of nature. The light and the rain, the sun and the moon and the stars on their world, and they seemingly never have inquired about any of them. They have their own small purpose, and they fill it completely out of themselves. The Taoist points out, therefore, that life, even in a little insect, is totally sufficient for its own needs. It is only in man with his reflection, his contemplation, his doubts and his worries, that life suddenly becomes more or less impossible. Actually, this problem of dependence is an illusion. It doesn't mean that we, as human beings, should not have relationships. We have much richer ability to know and to share and to do and can possibly belong to the little bird. Yet in our life, it is not that we should be less than the bird in this, but rather that we should be greater than the bird in everything. And that means also greater in security, greater in the security of our own inner life. We have infinitely more ways of protecting ourselves than the bird, yet we are much less secure because we do not have this direct participation in nature. We do not have uh, this wonderful sense of not knowing that there is anything to be afraid of. In the realization, we get something of that, but on a positive level. We gain this mysterious sense that factually and actually we are always alone, and yet we are never. 
every important function of life, birth, death, great sickness, even great joy, will be experienced alone. Somehow, everything that is important, we have to carry the full burden ourselves. This is not a penalty. This is a fulfillment. This is a privilege. This is the reason we are here. The life we share with other people is not a life of necessity, unless we make it that. It is a life of privilege and of opportunity. We should not be with other people because we want to lean on them, or because we are afraid to stand on, or on our own feet, or because we feel like some old Chinese communities, that the closer we are together, the safer we are. This should not be the basis of relationships. The basis of relationships should be a voluntary sharing, not a dependence. And this difference is part of our realization problem. For in realization, we can achieve this wonderful sense of security in space. But there is nothing evil. There is nothing dangerous. There is nothing to fear but truly fear itself. And as we quietly contemplate this and relax, we again lower pressure, we lower tension. And our spiritual life begins as our tensions go down. There can be no way of achieving an adequate spirituality in a constant confusion, discord, tension, and stress. Now we may feel that this stress is due to other people or other circumstances and that we cannot help it. This is simply not true. The stress may be caused by another person. But our acceptance of it, as stress, is our own private business. And there is no reason why we have to be over-influenced any more than we have any right to over-influence anyone else. We have a perfect right to live in a stressful world with the same gentle sense of interior security we find in the little birds. And today, perhaps, in this world in which we live, with all the tensions and the pressures we have created, the most fortunate of all creatures are those that are not human, but belonging to other ways of life, uh, are still able to go about in their numerous activities without very much concern over our political situation. This is perhaps a proof that nature protects the innocent. They are not to blame, therefore they are not punished. We are only punished if we are to blame. And this blame arises as an experience in our own consciousness, not in the circumstances that arise. Now there is another very interesting thing that I'd like to amplify just a little bit in our book. And that is quite near the end, where we make a story, or a little analogy about the human mind, which I think can take further thought. The more I read it, the better I liked it, so I'll share it with you again. Uh, it's about the uh, great Nordic god Thor, the mighty thunderer, the individual who rumbles his great hammer and rides through the heavens in his wooden chariot drawn by rams. He is, he's, quite a, he's quite a character in his own right. Uh, the charming allegory is the story of the difference between the personality and its principles. Thor of the mighty hammer, the destroyer of giants, is the human mind, the objective intellect. The mind is the conqueror of the mundane world and was the most powerful and, uh, uh, well, in a way, the most belligerent, and in another way, the most depended upon of all the gods. But although he was a deity in his own right, the gods all got together and made a rule. He was so heavy, so massive, so big, and, uh, in a sense, so excitable, that they would not let him enter heaven by the front door. 
he had to go around the back because the front door was a bridge of rainbow that connected heaven and earth. And it was figured that that bridge would never carry the weight of the great Tor and his hammer. So he always had to climb up the back of the mountain by the slow and difficult path. Now this, I think, is a very interesting analogy on the basis of the human mind. In a sense, this magic bridge, Bifrost, that connects heaven and earth, is a bridge of intuition, a bridge of extrasensory perception, a bridge of very delicate, subtle, internal lights and colors that form a wonderful rainbow of inner inspirational value. And it would certainly be rather uh, difficult to imagine great lumbering Thor trying to climb up this bridge. It would be as though uh, we place <coughs> a very aggressive intellectual in the presence of a very mystical person and expected the intellectual to understand. The mind, uh, which is by nature a battler, a great and massive instrument, valuable, but with limitations, has difficulty when it confronts an intuitional problem. <coughs> and reason, when confronted with this mystical, apperceptive power of man is not trusted to climb that bridge for fear will break it down. And reason is forever breaking down these subtle values. And reason is using its own intellective power in some mysterious way to weaken the element of creative intuition, imagination in man. So always in our meditations and in our mysticisms, we must remember that the mind, with its faculty, very useful, a great and strong giant who can also go out and destroy other giants. This mind, however, is a constant and continuing danger when it comes to the intuitive life of the individual. Thus, our illumination and our realization must, to a measure, reduce the intensities of the mental attitude toward life. Most of all, they must prevent us from substituting mentalism for mysticism. And there is a tremendous difference in these two things. The mind can accomplish almost any part of philosophy. It can master nearly any element of theology. The mind can read, remember, analyze, and digest the most abstract, mystical, and extra-physical conditions. The mind can explore anything, but of itself it cannot experience what it explores. Thus the mind is always the beholder and the observer. It is never the participator. The mind cannot share in the sheer mystery of life itself. It can write a book on what it cannot experience. It can carefully analyze and dissect all things relating to the universal plan, but it cannot experience these. Thus out of the mind come sciences. Out of the emotions comes art, come art. Arts come much nearer to experiences than sciences do. Because man's emotion is an older and richer instrument than his mind. But the mind itself can substitute a vicarious intellection for a fact. The individual can honestly believe that if he has remembered, he knows. That if he can call off great names, he is instructed. If he can quote from the sages, he is wise. And if he is achieved by his own genius the quadrature of the circle, he is illumined. These things he can believe. But we come back to the Indian proverb that the mind is the slayer of the real. Therefore, in all of our searches for realization and illumination, 
We must never be deceived by the mental substitute. We must never permit ourselves to assume that intellection is the substitute for the mystical internal experience of the individual. Nor can the individual become so wise in his mentation that he does not need the direct experience of value. Well, in our discussions of realization and illumination, we must point out that these are not intellectualized in truth or in reality, any more than the mysterious security of the small bird is intellectualized. It is not. It is there. It is fact. It is not thought. Now, the difference between a thought and a fact is a very important one. And thoughts may help us with facts. And facts may lead to thoughts. But the two are not identical terms. Therefore, if we have an extension of understanding and a reformation of conduct through inner enlightenment, we may then think for many years about the implications of this and stirred and spurred by inner enlightenment, the mind then becomes the instrument of recollection and also enables us to take a particular experience and expand it or extend it over a larger area of circumstances. The mind can take the key achieved by illumination and place it in many locks, giving us broader insight than we had previously possessed. But the mind, unless it is moved by and in service to the consciousness itself, can be and usually is merely an intellectual tyrant. So the, the, mental, the mental phase of an experience should never be accepted as that experience. An over-intellection about an experience before it occurs is likely to block the experience itself. This, I think, is uh, well worthy of our bearing in mind because we have to face it uh, more or less continuously as we proceed. Also, we have one other point. We are approaching this entire matter uh, from below upward. In other words, we have a perspective. The perspective from that uh, which is in a certain condition, toward a condition in advance of that now experience. This makes a perspective in an upward direction. And as we mentioned in one of our Sunday lectures recently, we have these psychological directions in space. If the direction, therefore, of the experience is forward and up, it also comes naturally to us that as we proceed along the way, each step of enlightenment will modify and change our basic attitude toward what we are doing. From where we are now, we are doing what we think is next and best. But when we have achieved, achieved to a higher degree of understanding, we may be forced to change or modify our principles of the moment or our directions at the moment or the directives by which we move. Nearly all persons writing books of a prophetic nature as to how the world is going to be a thousand years from now have forgotten some phase of this dimension. Therefore, they have simply pushed now into tomorrow, which you cannot do. Or they have taken certain faults of now and assumed that tomorrow they would be corrected. This was the burden of the old utopias, which were certainly idealistic in their time, but seem a little ridiculous to us today. Therefore, in moving forward, our whole attitude toward truth, our attitude toward self, toward enlightenment, towards understanding, realization, uh, toward illumination, these attitudes will change. They will never be less than they are, but they will be greater than they are.
for they will be more and more tinged with insight. And in all probability, this will have a very grave effect upon the motivations uh, with which we now move. We will find that our present motive will be outgrown along with our present mistakes. And that, as uh, one old and very wise mystic said, when man reaches near to illumination, as indicated in the last page, uh, where I quote an old Sufi uh, in this manner, as we approach illumination, the very fact of illumination becomes less interesting. At our present state, it's so something so infinitely to be desired that we are gravely concerned. But as we get nearer and nearer to us, to this end, it becomes so inevitable, so natural, uh, so completely reasonable and proper that we no longer regard it with any particular uh, uh, significance. It is then that we realize something else that we can learn from the little bird, namely that illumination is not a strange, distant, unnatural, wonderful state. It only seems to be. Illumination is simply, as we said in the beginning, a tree bearing its fruit. Perfectly natural, perfectly reasonable, perfectly proper, and utterly inevitable. We therefore view it as we would view any other of the commonplaces of life. We would regard it as that with the same feeling that we would say our child will grow up. In seven years, it will be mature. In ten years, it should be established in business and home. We think of these things as natural and probable uh, procedures. In our materialistic age, bound with the uncertainties that now circumscribe us, all spiritual things seem highly improbable. But as we grow and unfold and enrich our consciousness, all spiritual things become not only probable, but natural, inevitable, factual. And the person, as he approaches uh, the insight which he seeks, finds that this insight is not a tremendous or terrible experience. This insight is simply fulfillment of that which was obviously necessary and obviously there. So enlightenment presents no great challenge. It presents only the symbol of our spiritual maturity. It represents the condition of the person who has come into the full possession of those powers and faculties by which he was divinely endowed. Therefore, perhaps we may say, that when man achieves enlightenment, then he is a human being. Until then, sometimes we hardly know what to call him. But we are not quite certain that he is a success. This illumination problem, then, is our maturity. And if we can face it in a simple way like this, we will get away from the exaggerations that may lead us into illusion always to, over, to make things overly important is dangerous because it creates tension and self-deceit. Whereas if we simply say the growth from today, the right living now, the daily and honorable experience of proper self-improvement, dedication to principles and to truth, the gradual unfoldment and enrichment of life and faculty, these things are all moving us toward ourselves, toward the thing we were intended to be, toward the nature which we must be, for nature has, for, for universal nature has decreed it. Therefore, as nature makes the grass to grow, so it makes the soul of man to grow. And our illumination is simply man coming into the conscious participation in God. Awareness made rich so that he now lives in a universe with God and in God. He has always lived there, but he didn't know it. Therefore, illumination is man coming to know 
the thing as it is. But ignorance is his continuance of the state of not knowing, or the misknowing of things. Really, these things can be taken into our realization. They can be taken into our quiet meditation. And if we use these basic principles and precepts wisely and kindly, we will grow. And the problems which beset us will go less with time as it passes. And with the diminishing of problems will come the corresponding increase of insight. Well, our time is up, so I guess that's all we can do this evening.